Wired.com presents The Geek's Guide to the Galaxy. And here are your hosts, John Joseph Adams and David Barr Kirtley. Hi, this is Dave. And this is John. And welcome to episode 94 of Geek's Guide to the Galaxy. Our guest today is Margaret Atwood, author of the classic dystopian novel The Handmaid's Tale about a takeover of the American government by religious fundamentalists, as well as the book In Other Worlds, SF and the Human Imagination, an essay collection that examines mythology, utopias, and science fiction. Her most recent book is Mad Adam, a sequel to her novels Oryx and Crake and The Year of the Flood, about a mad scientist who tries to replace humanity with genetically engineered people of his own creation. Then stick around after the interview as Tobias Bakel and Paolo Bacigalupi join us for a panel on political agendas in science fiction. All right, so let's get to our interview. All right, so we're here with Margaret Atwood. Welcome to the show. Thank you. Okay, so your new book, Mad Adam, is set in the same world as your previous books, Oryx and Crake and The Year of the Flood. So would you recommend that people jump right into this one, or should they go back and read those other two books first? Um, I think that would be their own choice. You can certainly come in at any entry point. The, the first two run during the same time period, and the third one takes off from the end of both of them, therefore. Uh, and I did put a little Lord of the Rings type summary at the beginning uh, for those who might stumble upon the third one without knowing about the other two. All right. And I mean, most of the or a lot of the book deals with the backstory of the character Zeb, whose father was this sort of sleazy televangelist type who headed up a church called the Church of Petro Olium. Uh, could you just talk about the creative process you went through inventing that church? It wasn't much of a stretch. That is what the the word petroleum does come from those two Latin words. And um, there is a crossover already. Uh, but also it comes from people's true religion is what they worship, whether it's called a church or not. So if you're uh, dedicated to, for instance, the stock market to the exclusion of all else, you have a religion of the stock market, an, in, an invisible force that you, <laughs> that you pray to, uh, whether you know you're doing that or not. So it would just... Just as there was once a sun god, why would there not be an oil god? Yeah, I guess we should maybe explain, if people haven't read the book, that the Church of Petro Olium thinks that it was God's command, you know, God gave humans dominion over the earth, and it's our holy obligation to extract as much oil as possible. Well, because oil is holy, and because what do we anoint people with in the Bible but oil? Mm -hmm. So therefore, it must be holy, uh -huh. wouldn't you say? Uh, I, yeah, I mean, that's a pretty good argument. I mean, um, it, it, it seems <laughs> that like, you're convinced. <laughs> I mean, it seems like in the Bible, I mean, do you think you could make up a church about anything you could imagine and find justification for it in the Bible? I, I, no, you couldn't. Um, there, there are some things that you absolutely could not make up a religion about because they're not in the Bible. So you couldn't make up a church of avocados. <laughs> I don't think avocado is mentioned once. So it, it is restricted by what, what words are actually there. But people have interpreted those words many different ways and continue to do so. Uh -huh. I mean, one, one thing I think about a lot is that it seems to me that speculative fiction has a lot of the virtues of religion without many of its downsides. You are, you are not the first person to have noticed that. <laughs> uh, science fiction more particularly, that is... We can no longer do the burning bush plausibly, say, on on Fifth Avenue. Uh, anybody who saw a burning bush that talked to him on Fifth Avenue would probably be on some drug or having a mental episode. Or such, such would our interpretation be. But if you get on a spaceship and go to Planet X, the whole thing could be littered with burning bushes that talked. They would simply be an alien life form. And that is why certain kinds of theological discussion have moved off planet and are acted out on other planets uh, with imagined beings 
that can debate these questions much as angelic beings once debated them in Paradise Lost. Mm -hmm. And I guess uh, I also read your book In Other Worlds, uh, which is sort of an essay collection about speculative fiction and related subjects. And in that book, you saw... And science fiction. It's plain old outright science fiction, too. Yep, yep. Um, and in that book, you talk a lot about utopian stories, which are, you know, ideal societies and dystopian stories, which are nightmarish societies. And you also coined the term, usto the term eustopias, which are sort of, it's either a utopia or dystopia, depending on how you look at kind of a blend of the two. Um, which, how would you say that your studies into that, that sort of literature informs the Oryx and Craig trilogy? Oh, well, quite deeply, uh, because I'd been reading the raw material since I was about 10. And thinking about it in a more organized way since I was about 21. And I guess one of the things you can say is that having read so much of it, I know what some of the pitfalls are and tried to avoid them, therefore. Particularly with, with utopias, there's always a part where you get more or less a, uh, a tour of the... <laughs> which you did quite a lot in communist countries anyway. You got a tour of the factory and a lecture that goes... Uh, in olden day societies, they made these horrible mistakes and did these bad things, but we fix that now, and here's how we do it. So um, do you want to talk a little bit about utopias? Do you, do you consider... Where would you put Oryx, the Oryx and Yeah, I think on? they're the same. I think utopia and dystopia are essentially flip sides of the same form. Uh, and then every... Utopia has a dystopia concealed within it, and every dystopia has got a utopia concealed within it. Um, otherwise, you wouldn't have anything to judge the bad by. Uh, and in 19th century utopias, of which there were really a lot, many, many, many were written then, because people did think that great improvements were being made and that the uh, world was, if not perfectible, almost so. And uh, they wanted to do something about the deplorable uh, slum conditions and um, and uh, polluted environments that they saw around them then. Uh, so they they wrote a lot of them, and indeed they started utopian societies. Coleridge had the idea of being part of one of them. Nathaniel Hawthorne uh, dabbled in it. The Shakers and Quakers were, of course, both utopian communities, and the American adventure started as another such with the 17th century Puritans, thinking that they were going to build God's kingdom on earth or close to it. Uh, so this is not so, so utopianism as both something people wrote about and something people did lasted say from maybe the seventeenth to the to the end of the nineteenth century. And then it kind of blew up literally with the First World War and the Second World War and a couple of other experiments in utopias. So the USSR and Hitler's Germany were both experiments in utopianism, you know, grand plan, gonna make everything much better except, first of all, we have to get rid of these people, followed by Mao's China and and Pol Pot, just as examples. There's some minor ones, too, Ceausescu's Romania and uh, uh, the Albanian adventure, etc. So, utopia became much harder for us to, to credit you know, the perfect society that was going to come into being as the result of a the imposition of an overarching plan. Okay, so each utopia always had a little dystopia, the part where we had to get rid of those people. And each dystopia had a utopia, the better society that we either remembered or hoped to escape to. Uh -huh. Well, and so in the Oryx and Craig trilogy, what aspects of that world do you see as the utopian aspects and which as the dystopian? Okay, the utopian thinking, of course, is done by Craig himself. Things are going to be so much better, except first we have to get rid of those people. And uh, those people, that uh, would be everybody. the human race. That would be the human race. Well, not quite everybody. 
Uh, he leaves Jimmy alive as a shepherd to the new, new people who um, have had some of what he considers to be our imperfections uh, removed from them. Thus, they have uh, built-in sunblock and insect repellent, which I think would be good things. They don't need clothing and therefore will never have a cotton industry or a fashion industry or any uh, cotton mills. They are not only vegetarian, they can eat grass and leaves, so they will never have to have agriculture. They will not have to have herd animals. And they will not, therefore, be territorial. They will not suffer from romantic despair. They will never be rejected romantically because they breed seasonally like most other mammals. They aren't sort of possibly on all the time like us. To that end, in breeding season, parts of them turn blue. So there's never any mistake. They don't, uh, because they breed in, in groups, uh, they're not worried about paternity. Yeah, and, and I mean, so you say that things like built-in insect repellent you see as a good thing. Um, do you actually... Uh, no, how, wouldn't that, you think it would be a good thing? <laughs> I, I do it for sure, yeah. But I, I got yes, the feeling yes, your your review of Bill McKibben's book enough kind of gave me the idea yeah. that you were not in favor of genetically engineering humans. Um, I'm not in favor of genetic engineering as a commercial pursuit today. There are genetic engineering programs on offer in the world of Oryx and Crank in which you can get your baby tweaked. Is it going to be like a, the catalog out of which you pick the height, weight, eye color, intelligent level, and curliness of hair? I think that's probably a pretty bad idea. On the other hand, if it's a matter of disease elimination, that is probably a pretty good thing. Um, okay, well, I mean, you were, earlier it came up a little bit about speculative about speculative fiction and science fiction. And so you, you've defined speculative fiction as essentially stories that take place on Earth and employ elements that already exist in some form. Yeah, so it's a matter of truth and labeling. So when people think science fiction, they do think, whether you like it or not, they think spaceships and, as one person said, lycra. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, so that is just a question of, of what you're going to put on the box. And I like there to be inside the box what it says on the outside there is going to be. Somebody did quite a wonderful book a few years back about comic book promises, that is, things that you could send away for from the backs of comic books. And they sent away for all of them. And then they compared the promise with what they actually got. <laughs> In most cases, there was very little resemblance. So I like there to be, I like there to be some resemblance between uh, what is promised on the outside and what you get on the inside. And if it says science fiction, I want there to be something that doesn't already exist. Uh huh. Did you think that causes there con to be a confusion? Um, only I think amongst people who are already using a, a label in a very large sense that includes all kinds of stuff. And we could usually go through it and say what it isn't. For instance, um, is Dracula science fiction? Okay, well, I mean, I would see, I mean, the way that most people that I know define speculative fiction would be a wide range of fantasy, supernatural horror, and science fiction. And then science because fiction. Because they think those things might actually exist. Well, no, I, I mean, speculative fiction is often just a, a, an umbrella term for a wide range of non-realistic fiction. Okay, I would put a different label over the top of that and I would call it all wonder tales. Uh -huh. that, that includes everything. And then underneath that, you can have various subsets such as um, sword and sorcery fantasy and um, you know, with dragons, without dragons. You could have um, science fiction proper, which would be... Uh, with spaceships and other planets and 
really amazing inventions. Uh, you could have what I would call speculative fiction, which would be things we could actually do and probably have done to some extent. Right. I mean, but if you're if you're asking how I would define science fiction, I it, I would tend to think of it as that it's uh, wonder tales, as you put it, that uh, presuppose a scientific worldview. So it's not so much is it you know possible or impossible, but if it were to be <laughs> explained, would the explanation be a scientific? Yeah, but a lot of stuff that we that that people would call science fiction, the the worldview is not scientific at all, and it, it has a sort of uh, palaver of of scientism applied onto it um, but it isn't really in fact there's there's quite often a, a lot of magical thinking in it you mean like, like star wars for example star wars for exactly yeah i mean that's why i wouldn't actually classify science uh, star wars as science fiction in partic particularly but you would call it science fiction fantasy or yeah, science fantasy or, or galactic yeah. fantasy of some kind yeah so, and where would we put Star Trek? We would probably put Star Trek somewhere in the middle. Yeah, well, I mean, I think Star Trek, you know, does have, everything is presumably explained by science. It's just a lot of the science is not particularly rigorous. It's just rigorous. science we haven't done yet. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, but, I mean, I guess, I mean, you've said that people are sometimes hostile to you when you uh, don't want to use the term science fiction for some of your books. Just truth and labeling again. Yeah. I mean, what have been some of the most uh, sort of intense reactions that you've experienced? I don't know. I, I think I think probably you might, you might ask. Jonathan Latham actually wrote quite a good piece about this a little while ago, um, about hanging out with the, with the sci-fi uh, cultists. Uh, his worldview is probably a bit out of date now because it, it was presupposed on you know, literary people scorn us, they won't let us into their clubhouse, so we're not going to let them into ours. Uh, but when you have the New Yorker doing uh, a science fiction issue, I would say that that particular door is no longer closed. And it should never have been closed in the first place because you cannot write a history of of uh, prose narrative in the 20th century without including um, H.G. Wells, without Brave New World, without 1984. Um, those are key books of the century, I would say. Mm -hmm. Anyway, so there there is this sort of, um, there was this sort of skirmish going on in the bookie world about who was allowed to be in what room people lay claim to literary territories a lot and then they try to fence them off but uh, it never finally works uh -huh. you know when we interviewed Ursula K. Le Guin last year she mentioned that she's had a long running debate with you about the term science fiction yeah it's about terminology but she wouldn't deny that there are those two kinds of fiction I think it's just a question of what to call them and we did in fact do an on stage conversation when I published Another World, and in the preface to that book, you can find that matter discussed. She was a naughty Ursula. <laughs> <laughs> uh, all right, and I mean, speaking of Ursula K. Le Guin, you discuss her work quite a bit in, in Other Worlds, yes. and um, you also yes, mention other, other recent science fiction authors like Octavia Butler and Stanislav Lem and William Gibson. Yes. Uh, is it fair to say that those are some of your favorite science fiction authors? Um, I guess you would have to say that, wouldn't you? Does that mean that there are others that I also like that I haven't mentioned? I'm not sure. I'd have to go back and look at the index. Um, I heard it suggested that Octavia Butler's uh, Will of Sprood maybe it was an influence on, Oryx and, on the Oryx and Craig trilogy? Um, no, because I didn't read it until after I'd indeed written Oryx and Crake. So it was through writing Oryx and Crake that people came to suggest it. You also say in the book that in when you were working on a dissertation that you, you covered all sorts of authors who might be considered somewhere all on sorts. the fantasy and science yeah. fiction spectrum. Yeah, they were completely... No, nobody else was doing any academic work on that kind of thing, banned. Uh -huh. 
You, you called the metaphysical was, romances the books you were focused on? I made on? that up. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> I like it, though. I mean. Yeah, I think it's pretty good. Well, it was that strain that led from George MacDonald through Ryder Haggard into um, C.S. Lewis and, and Tolkien. And uh, I was mostly interested in the supernatural women figures who had uh, pre-comic book superpowers of various kinds. And that was very, very distinct from the other thing that was forming in the 19th century, which was the Jules Verne, um, what I would call the great granddaddy of speculative fiction. That is, he wrote about stuff that he thought could actually happen, such as submarines. And when H.G. Wells come, came along with stuff that everybody knew couldn't happen, such as the time machine, Jules Verne was horrified. He said, me, il en vont. But he's inventing things, <laughs> which we now take it for granted that people invent things. But it was perfectly new then, and the term science fiction was not used about it. It didn't come into use until the late twenties. I mean, it seems like I mean that that distinction is problematic in a way, though, because uh, you know it presupposes that we can know what's possible and what isn't. I mean, like yes. I know a lot of very smart people who are absolutely convinced that we'll be uploading our minds to computers within the next century. Yes, and an equal number of equally smart people who think that that's completely ridiculous. Yeah, well, the the fact that you can argue it means that it's 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 within the realm of speculative fiction. Um, but I mean, for, I would have said that teleportation was completely ridiculous as well. But there have been recent, you know, experiments with quantum teleportation, which show that maybe it's not as ridiculous as you would have thought. So it does seem to me it's still maybe not in theory, but we're not in the land of the fly yet. <laughs> no. Help me! Help me! We're not there yet. <laughs> but you, you're not troubled by that at all. That. That you know, we it's it's hard, it's hard to say actually what might be possible. In no, the I'm not troubled. I'm not troubled by that at all. Um, and I know it's hard to say. And I also know that a lot of the stuff I've got a piece in in that book called Another Worlds about Jonathan Swift, in which I look at book three of Gulliver's Travels, a book that most people kind of skip because they don't really um, doesn't really interest them. But it, it's the one in which he's making fun of the Royal Academy, essentially. Uh, in the early age of scientific experiments. And a lot of the stuff he was making fun of in a kind of backhanded way is now actually coming into being. So, yes, I know that can happen, that, pe that one age is common sense um, is another one's discarded superstition. You know, we, we surely all know that by now. And the one thing about science and the way it proceeds, it's constantly self-correcting. Mm -hmm. um, I guess the, another thing you say in other worlds is that at various times, the real world was, has seemed to drift dangerously close to Brave New World or 1984 or The Handmaid's Tale. And so just in our yeah. current situation, which dystopia or dystopias do you fear most? I, I think we're going to get them all at once. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, yeah, I think the I think the actually I'm I'm about to review a book that takes on uh, another version of of Brave New World, our version, the version that we're actually that we actually find ourselves enmeshed in even as we speak, and that would be the ability to to track and as it were publish everyone all the time. And I'm sorry, this is, you're reviewing a book about this. I'm reviewing a book that's taking that on, and, and it's by David Eggers, Dave Eggers. And it's called The Circle, and it's coming out in October. But that is what's concerning us right now because of the revelations of, about data mining uh, that have been done by, for instance, the U.S. government, and they're not alone. So tracking people through the Internet basically is what it is. Uh, you know, I don't, I don't know if you know, David Brin wrote a book called The Transparent Society, where he actually argued that yeah. that would actually be a good thing, that we should just forget about yes, privacy. I know. Sure, I know, and that some of the people in Dave Eggers' book are arguing exactly that. 
So that that harks back to a well, you know, it harks back to a lot of earlier work. I don't know whether you remember a play by UNESCO called Rhinoceros. The idea that if everybody could see everybody all the time, nobody would ever do anything bad. But would that be such a good thing? Because what you're what you're actually proposing is a kind of very paranoia-inducing crowd mentality, which is really pretty close to Newspeak in 1984. In other words, we'll make it impossible for you to think certain thoughts because we will just remove the possibility from you. Mm -hmm. And also, uh, an another recent project you just have been working on is the Positron, uh, which yes. is... Positron on, on byliner. So another example of how uh, new technologies enable old forms. Dickens uh, published in serial form in the 19th century, and so did a lot of writers then in mid-century. And serials migrated to newspapers and magazines. And then short fiction magazines shrank and faded in the uh, 70s and 80s, leaving the New Yorker standing like a lone, a lone mountain peak. <laughs> uh, so what the Internet has enabled is the return of uh, short fiction online and read it in one go investigative journalism and serial publishing. So there's that one, and then there then there's also Wattpad, W A T T P A D, where a lot of people are writing and publishing in serial form using their phones. I noticed in the book description for Positron Episode Four, you were described as the quote unquote diva of dystopias. I was just wondering what. Yeah, you that about wasn't my. Yeah. <laughs> that wasn't my description, um, but it's fun. <laughs> Um, all right. Well, so, uh, are there any, uh, any other projects or like, what are you up to right now? Is there anything you want to mention? Well, there's a couple of associated things. Um, some kids came and said, how about doing Mad Adam as a video game? And I said, I think it would be too huge for that, but there is a video game inside Mad Adam itself. Actually, there are three of them in the chapter called Intestinal Parasites, the Game. So why don't you make those? And so they have done it. They've made Intestinal Parasites, the Game, and you can download it as an app. And so far they've, I think they're going to do a number of different organs, and so far they've done, they've done, they've gone as far as the lungs. <laughs> Um, and so have you have you played it? Are you a, a gamer at all? I've played it. I'm going to have to practice because I I can't get past level three. And every time you fail at a level, a sign comes up saying, you have died. It's quite blunt. Mm. So if that does well, will we see Extinctathon? <laughs> they wanted to make Extinctathon, and I told them it would be way too boring. <laughs> <laughs> it's an actual game. You know, it's it's uh I don't you, you could make a game called Extinctathon that would be quite a lot more exciting than the one that's described in the book. But intestinal parasites I think is gonna be is gonna keep everyone occupied for, for the foreseeable future. Uh -huh. <laughs> All right, great. So I think we're gonna wrap things up there. So we've been speaking with Margaret Atwood. The new book is called Mad Adam. So thanks for joining us. And thank you. And that was our interview. So thanks so much to Margaret Atwood for joining us on the show. And as we mentioned for our panel today, we'll be discussing political agendas in science fiction. So basically any work of fiction that has a clear political message. And we're joined by not one, but two guest geeks. So first up, we've got Tobias Bakel making his fourth appearance on the show. He's the author of the Xenowealth series of space adventure novels, as well as the New York Times bestselling Halo novel, The Cole Protocol, and the near-future eco-thriller Arctic Rising. And you can learn more about him by listening to our chat with him back in episode 56. So, Toby, welcome to the show. Hey, thanks for having me. 
And also joining us today is Paolo Bacigalupi, author of the mega award-winning novel The Wind-Up Girl, as well as young adult books like Shipbreaker, which was a National Book Award finalist and New York Times bestseller. His new novel is called Zombie Baseball Beatdown and focuses on issues of race, immigration, and industrial meat in America. And you can learn more about him by listening to our interview with him all the way back in episode two. So, Paolo, welcome to the show. Glad to be here. All right. And so when I think about political agendas among science fiction writers, kind of the first author that comes to mind for me is Robert Heinlein, who I read a lot of books by when I was young. And Paolo, in our interview with you back in episode two, you mentioned that you, you read some early Heinlein books like Citizen of the Galaxy. And I was just wondering, like, when you were young like that, did the politics in those books strike you or did you just see them as kind of fun stories? I, you know, when I was reading those books, honestly, I, I read them for story. I don't think I was aware particularly that there might be some other layering of values or agenda inside of those books at all. I was purely in it for the adventure, for the fights, for the, you know, kids figuring things out and learning better than they had before, things like that. So no, it was, it was actually, you know, probably it was worming its way deep into my brain, but I didn't notice. <laughs> uh, uh, how about Toby? Did you read any Heinlein growing up? I did. Uh, Citizen of the Galaxy is another one that, just uh, like other people have said, had a big impact on me as a kid. It sort of had that go west young man, Horatio Alger sort of, you know, appeal to it that kind of had a big impact. I read most of Heinlein's other books, too, by the time I was uh, in high school. And I think I remember the specific point where I started to realize that Heinlein might have had an agenda because like Paolo, I was very focused on the story. I mean, basically what I wanted to see were young adults achieving against great odds and anyone who was going to sort of deliver that to me sort of got my attention. I think the moment I started to realize that there was something there that didn't quite sit right was when I read Friday, which I really wanted to like for yeah. the Neuromancer sort of uh, uh, early cyberpunk pieces of it. it. It just, it had so many buttons that it was going to press that I would have loved. But uh, there's that one, of course, really obvious moment where the, the hero is getting raped and, and the author sort of says, like, well, if you just go ahead and enjoy it, it's not a problem. And yep. I remember even as a sort of 13-year-old, 12-year-old with sort of like no sort of like ally sort of cookies on my side towards feminism, like I was, I was you know, not a very good ally but I just remember at that moment sort of something breaking in the back of my head and going like, now, wait a second, that doesn't seem to match up with how things work in the real world. And then sort of reexamining everything else I'd read and going, oh, there's a whole, there's all this other stuff here that's kind of being slipped in and, and sort of becoming suspicious from then on. Mm. Well, and there's something interesting about that, because when you're looking at that, you know, a book like Friday, or you look at, you know, any number of books, I think there's sort of a slightly different question of like, whether you're talking about n novels that have a political agenda versus novels that are infused with the author's political mm. and values systems. Um, you know, I think about uh, a lot of um, Bane books, for example, will have sort of a thread of the author's value system. When I'm reading David Weber, you know, or whatever, there's sort of a an ongoing thread of, you know, anti-liberal sort of of values sort of like threaded through the book. Um, but it's Oh, look, not... there's a hero who said that we should talk nicely to the aliens and he just got his head chopped off. Right, exactly. And, but, you know, but it, it's not quite at the level of, of sort of political advocacy exactly. It's more just sort of like, you know, his, his values are just infusing the story. And I think Heinlein's sort of very strange views on women sort of infused his books, but I'm not quite sure if he was even, I mean, I don't know. I, I'm not sure that he actually had an agenda towards women exactly i think he just has screwed up values <laughs> and that just sort of really like a good point um and i mean it's hard to say what heinlein's politics were at least for me i mean i understand that he actually campaigned for a socialist candidate early in his life and then you know uh, stranger in a strange land was all about nudism and free love and stuff but then starship troopers is often criticized for being essentially a advocating fascism I think that once his characters start actually being genuine political mouthpieces, you start seeing, you know, when Jubal Harshaw sort of gets up and starts <laughs> advocating for his compound and, and his weaponry, um, you know, there's there that's the moment where you sort of, I feel like you start seeing, um, you know, genuine sort of political mouthpiece 
work happening for Heinlein. Um, and there are also two other factors. One, of course, in which he was writing in a more heavily censored era than we are. So some of his own sort of abilities to say and advocate for everything that he wanted it comes easier later in life for him as he's writing stories past that sort of more cleaned up era of the 50s and 60s, as it is for many science fiction writers. And also the fact is like some people do through, go through dramatic political changes in their lives. And there are a lot of people I know who have sort of very hard right wing beliefs who sort of were really extraordinarily strongly leftist in the beginning. They they sort of were young and idealistic and really strong, had really strong thoughts about exactly how the world should work. And when they couldn't sort of move the world in that direction, bounced off hard against it and kind of rebounded in another direction. And uh, what I notice is that some of those people have just very hardcore beliefs that things should be a certain way, whether it's a leftist, socialist, you know, thing that's top, imposed top down, what they seem to crave is order. You know, you, th that's the sort of four quadrants rather than the left, right. Left, right is very a uniquely American way of viewing this. Mm. And I sort of, I wanted to start with Heinlein because I think he's also emblematic of this trend that, that Paolo mentioned that of an author who starts out writing stories and get, and they become more and more didactic. And mm -hmm. you know, it's like the author starts out saying, you know, once, once he gets confidence that people like what he has to say, he's like, well, I'm sure people want, want to know all about my political views and my sex life too. Yeah. And I, I heard this described once as brain rot. I tried to uh, <laughs> Google it. I couldn't find it. I'm pretty sure that was what it was called. But this is not just limited to Heinlein. This apparently afflicts a lot of science fiction authors as they age. I think that there's there's a period where I think that as a, as a writer, you're trying to you're trying to win over readers, and I think that's when you'll favor story over agenda, um, recognizing that the only way you're ever going to reach a reader is if you have a story. And then there's a later stage maybe where, yeah, the author um, becomes so confident that they're well-loved, that they're, and also maybe so impatient with the, the complexity and difficulty of trying to weave your, your political values into a story that you finally just sort of say, fuck it, I'm going to take the gloves off. And you just start writing and saying, this is exactly what I think. Or, or maybe you just get frustrated that your fiction isn't having the impact on the world that you want it to. And right. So, you know, like, like H.G. Wells, I think, toward the end of his life, sort of despaired of the ability of his novels to get across the points he wanted to make and, and got more into politics and outright uh, advocacy. Right. Yeah. No, I think, I think, yeah, you sort of, you see yourself bumping off the world, the world doesn't care. And so you say, well, maybe if I say it louder, they'll hear me. Mm -hmm. And to be fair, uh, the way niches work is that even if you cleave off 50% of your potential audience, if you grow that other potential audience to a certain size, you can still sustain a large readership, right? Because you don't have a readership that's composed of the entire potential country. So there are plenty of, you know, I, I, a lot of people, you know, used to sort of tell me that I shouldn't talk about any kind of politics when I was starting out as a writer. Don't, don't ever do it. Don't ever do it. And don't say anything about politics on your blog because all it does is scare readers off. And for a long time, I was terrified of, of sort of doing any of that. And since I tend to be very politically moderate anyway, it was very easy for me not to kind of weigh in. Actually, every time I take those political tests, I, I fall somewhere in the center of the quadrant. Um, and the problem with that, though, is, is that it fails to recognize that you don't have command of that entire audience. You, you're, a su you're a subsampling set of potential readers. And so if you decide to talk about your politics, it's completely okay because yes, you'll lose some readers, but on the other side, you'll also be gaining a bunch of readers who go like, Ooh, look, this is shiny. You know, for as much as we're frustrated, you know, at times online by some of the horrific things Orson Scott Card can say, it certainly isn't really stopping his books from going out to the readers. And the other sad thing is that like most readers uh, probably don't even notice a lot of that stuff because they're reading for story. You know, and everyone's experience with a piece of literature is completely different. So, you know, the the these sort of compelling things that we think about what should and shouldn't be done all kind of go out the window when it actually, you know, rubber kind of hits the ground. Well, I mean, John, what do you think about that issue of sort of alienating readers with your with politics? Is that something you worry about editing anthologies and magazines and stuff like that? It's not something that I've ever particularly worried about uh, beforehand. Uh, I. I have experienced some blowback uh, from various uh, types of uh, readers uh, for some of my books, like Wastelands and the Living Dead. Uh, 
there have been like some really negative Amazon reviews, which were criticizing them for being overly political and like leftist propaganda and whatnot. And I mean, for Wastelands, for instance, I mean, I, I really never considered that. I was like, wait, we, we don't agree on the apocalypse being bad. Like, <laughs> I, I, I thought that it was pretty safe. And I, I, I don't think of it as particularly a political book. Um, Brave New Worlds and The Living Dead are both uh, fairly political. I mean, The Living Dead, I mean, because obviously uh, zombies are often used to uh, make political points. And there are several stories in there that are overtly political. And then Brave New Worlds being a dystopian book, um, the, it, it, you know, there's a lot of political type stuff in there. And uh, like when I was doing Brave New Worlds, I mean, I guess I, you know, I was more conscious of it at the time when I was putting it together, but I didn't really let it affect what stories I wanted to put in there. I put in the things that I thought um, fit the theme best. And as it happened, um, I did, I don't think I came across anything that was like, oh, this is going to be, this is going to please the right versus the left or whatever. So, um, it's not something I've ever really thought about, but, um, maybe my anthologies would sell better if I did. Well, John, uh, what were your thought processes when you're doing Seeds of Change, which is, uh, I have a story in that, but that was a really sort of interesting anthology. Uh, yeah, well, with that one, I mean, that was more like, uh, it was so wide open, the theme, um, the idea of Seeds of Change was to imagine um, paradigm shifts. And uh, so that one um, actually turned out a lot more politically oriented than I was expecting it to. Um, and uh, like, you know, your story, Toby, is about the importance of voting. So that one was, um, that one was specifically on the more political side. That, that one's also in Brave New Worlds. And uh, one of the ones that I thought was on the more political side of things. But um yeah, yeah, I mean, it wasn't it wasn't something that I actually really uh, started out trying to position the book as, and it just sort of ended up that way. Because like uh, Ted Kazmatka's story is about uh, like sort of racism, and 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 uh, you know, there's a story in there about like recycling, which is it's like a humorous story, but still, it's like making a point. And so a lot of the stories ended up making points like that. Um, so it just it sort of came about organically rather than being a specific plan from the get go, because the uh, the general idea was just to imagine what sort of paradigm shifts might happen in the future. Mm. Well, I think that's really striking, John, when you say that, you know, you, you were surprised that people saw this political angle in the books more than you had even, you know, realized or thought was there. And I mean, I think that one thing that Orson Scott Card said that I, you know, one of the things he said that I agree with, uh, or that I thought was really interesting is he said that what gives away your politics as an author is not what you, not the messages you think you're putting into it, but the mm -hmm. stuff you take for granted so much that you don't even think about the, you mm. don't even think about it. Mm -hmm. And, um, and I thought that was interesting. But I mean, Paolo, what do you think about that? Do you, to what extent do you consciously put messages into your books? And to what extent do they, are they just, do they just emerge? Uh, I think early on, I, I wasn't consciously doing, uh, I wasn't actually trying to advocate or, or describe any particular political agenda. Um, that was actually the most interesting thing to me about stories was trying to figure out ways to sort of, uh, inject my viewpoints into story. Um, and so I think around the time that I wrote The People of Sand and Slag, I started thinking of fiction as also being a political argument. And and that became um, fairly overt. Um, ideally, I'm entertaining the reader and I haven't sort of lapsed into that deep didacticism. But uh, I know that some some readers are turned off by what I do. So, well, I mean, one of our listeners actually commented, he said that he thought the politics, the, the political message in The Wind Up Girl was more overt than in. Uh, say Shipbreaker or some of the other later books. Do you, mm -hmm. do you, what do you think of that uh, analysis? I, I guess I guess it kind of depends. I mean, I, I suspect that maybe he, the buttons that I was pushing in Shipbreaker weren't his buttons. Um, and so, if I'm writing in in the Windup Girl about GMOs and sort of Monsanto-like corporations uh, cynically taking over the world, then and that's a button for him. It's going to stand out really bright on his dashboard, sort of, and he's going to react against that. Um, he might not have a sense that when I write about the idea that our families are not uh, valuable according to whether or not we're blood related to people, but whether or not we're affinity related to people. Um, I, I, I think I, I have a I have a very much overt political agenda there. I actually think that blood isn't worth crap as far as family goes. And the only people who matter are the people who actually support and sort of help you and and that, you know, you should chuck every family member who doesn't who isn't there to do that for you. Um, so I, I think, you know, perhaps for that reader, you know, that wasn't a, a political agenda for him, but I was pretty much trying to like rip out the idea that family matters at all. So, <laughs> um, 
you know, I guess it really, I guess it really depends. Um, but I think, uh, ultimately I think also that Shipbreaker was much more explicitly an adventure story. Um, and so perhaps just even the, the movement of the plot means that there's less room for, uh, for me to sort of bog down in sort of other political values, or maybe even for him to notice that, you know, the wrecked world that Naylor is navigating. And, uh, so, yeah. Well, so, so Toby, I mean, you mentioned that you're like super, super in the center of the political spectrum. So do you think that your work is also super, super in the center of the political spectrum? Or do you find yourself expressing more sort of uh, emphatic views in your fiction? I used to think it was politically centered until it came out in the States. And I suddenly found myself described as a uh, multiculturalist left wing uh, person of color who's forcing it down everyone's throats. Um, you fucking Nazi. And getting lots and lots of <laughs> just horrible hate mail from people who were determined to prove to me that black people would never get into space. They didn't have the technical capacity and I should stop writing stories about it. Um, to me, it seemed to be a very vaguely centrist proposition that there would be uh, people of color in outer space, and I wanted to populate my books with them, but apparently I'm part of a vast left-wing conspiracy. Mm. Um, the reaction to publishing those books probably politicized me more than I, I was expecting and has actually made me push back. I went into this being – I started out probably way more of a milk toast writer than I am today. In other words, by milk toast, I mean – sort of uh, working really hard to not really kind of uh, piss everyone off, right? And now I kind of get a certain glee in trying to piss everyone off, actually, uh, in terms of writing stories. In fact, one of my favorite stories that um, yeah, I'll brag a little bit, but uh, Dave Kletch is a Marine from uh, my acquaintance circles, who's a writer who's up and coming, who's really awesome. And we co-wrote a story in which I actually explicitly uh, sent out an email saying like, here are all the points that'll piss off people on the left on this issue. And here are all the points that'll piss off people on the right. I want to kind of include them all in this and see if we can hit them beat by beat mm -hmm. when we were coming up with the idea for the story. Because I think that actually, you know, uh, Paolo was talking about like examining personal values. I mean, for me, a lot of fiction is actually self-exploration. And sometimes it's really useful to kind of dig around these issues, left or right, to kind of see, like, what is it I really believe? And I will come to the stories after having done research about things that are sort of sitting, on, sitting heavy on me and sometimes write stories that come at them from different angles just to sort of explore different, different modes of attack. And that's kind of helped me grow as a human being. Um, I used to scoff at people who talked about writing fiction as a form of therapy, but it's actually been really interesting where I've evolved. I say that uh, when I started out, I was way more centrist than I am. I've probably moved just a slight bit uh, left of center. I just took the four quadrants test a while back and I've moved like a half unit over to the left mm -hmm. because of the research I've done that have convinced me that issues that are kind of considered left in the States actually work out to centrist in, in the rest of the world. For example, uh, free healthcare and uh, gun control, which I used to be uh, way more quote unquote to the right on the issue of, and having read as much as I could on the subject over the last five years have ended up having to kind of revoke my previous decisions. And some of the things I'm struggling with in that kind of have slyly worked themselves into some of my fiction. Well, I mean, one thing that really struck me, Toby, is online people, I've seen people, you know, call you a dirty commie or something like that. <laughs> and you say, you know, given my background, I have relatives who actually were murdered by left wing. Yeah, it's always, yeah, group. It's, it's very insulting for me when people kind of level that accusation at me because I literally actually, you know, have, uh, you know, I, I don't know how close the, the relationships are, but I mean, according to what people tell me, there are people I'm related to that have been actually literally lined up against the wall and shot for the revolution. Um, it has kind of an indelible mark on you. I grew up in the midst of a failed communist, uh, you know, I mean, I grew up in Grenada, which the U.S. invaded. So I also have these sort of anti colonial, post-colonial uh, background, but I also have this sort of like knee-jerk reflexive, uh, reflexive fear of sort of communist takeover. Um, and it's, it's always very insulting when people come at me like that because it sort of is, is not a, it's not a very nice thing to do to me. <laughs> uh, I really like this idea of, of what you're talking about, Toby, of, of including something in a science fiction, in a futuristic science fiction story where you have elements from the left and elements for the right that would sort of piss off those factions just because like that feels like a much more fully realized future to me just because like unless you ima unless you're imagining a future in which one side sort of wins more so over the other or whatever um it just seems like more realistic but um 
given that if, if you have a story where you're adding uh, elements of both, uh, you can't really try to guess what the author's actual position on those things are. And I think that's an interesting idea because um, when I was working at FNSF, we published a story by Harry Turtledove called Bedfellows. And it was probably the most explicitly political thing Gordon had published. It, it was basically about a man named W and a man named O who were <laughs> like leaders of their political factions and they get married. And, you know, obviously it's George W. Bush and Osama bin Laden. And, um, and so, uh, I thought it was really interesting because I was talking to Harry Toldov about it and he was really trying to make clear that, you know, you shouldn't make any assumptions about what his actually political views are based on that story. And uh, so I just uh, I, I think there's like a real danger in just assuming that, you know, what an author's uh, stances are on things because you read some piece of fiction, because like. When I was reading Heinlein when when I was younger, you know, I, I read this stuff in like Starship Troopers and like, you know, service, guarantee, citizenship and all that kind of all the other fascist type of stuff that he's gotten there. It's like that just seemed really interesting to me to think about. Like, it's not something I necessarily agree with, but it just I, I, I like when authors take those kinds of things and they put them in stories and they throw them out there so that you at least think about them and consider them and, and see what sort of societies might develop with that kind of thing in place. Well, for me, that's that's the tremendous value of science fiction is is game playing out scenarios. And I mean, Starship Troopers stands the test of time as being a very interesting play out. I would hate to live in a society that existed like that. And I suspect Heinlein might have also not enjoyed that, given some of the stuff I've read about his thoughts on it. You know, it's a a look at what a Spartan world, a Spartan future world might look like. And let's all, not also. Uh, forget that uh, he wrote, like we said, Stranger in a Strange Land, which is a very different novel, which was written at exactly the same time as Starship Troopers. And actually, one of the things I really enjoy about Heinlein is, is a lesser known series. I think it's the, uh, it has a lot of problems in and of itself, but his uh, series of novels about future political revolts in the United States, I think uh, the Fifth Column series, which uh, due to the fact that John Campbell commissioned them are incredibly racist. But one of the political things in them that was really interesting to me was if you read the entire set of series is that everyone who becomes the political heroes and, and throws the system over and takes over and becomes in charge eventually becomes the corrupt political system that needs to be overthrown by the heroes of the next book. And that indicated to me a sort of sense of a lot more, more sort of grayness about his beliefs about politics than people might otherwise be willing to attribute to him. Well, like like John was saying, I mean, the story that's always sort of stuck in my mind of a story that I enjoyed, despite the fact that it really made me angry uh, with the views it espoused, was there's this folk Hittic story called The Pre-Persons. It's this very sort of transparent anti-abortion story mm -hmm. where society has arbitrarily decided that children under the age of about eight or 12, something like that, are not people. And so they can just be euthanized at will. And there are these sort of like dog catcher trucks that oh go around. Oh my God, it's like a utopia. <laughs> <laughs> And uh, well, I mean, it's sort of like Pelo's Pelo, like your story, uh, Pop Squad. Sure. Right. Yeah. No. Where? Yeah. The the kids are you aren't supposed to be having kids, and so you can just knock them off if anybody has any, because everybody can live forever. So so they just don't have enough room to have any more kids. So everybody's immortal, but nobody's allowed to have kids, and so anybody who's having any illegal kids, you can just go around and just pop them off. And <laughs> that was well, a great Pal story to what, write. <laughs> what do you? Say? What do you think of that issue, though, in general, Powell, of uh, can you enjoy a story if you disagree really strongly with the political views that it espouses? Well, I was a huge fan of David Weber books. I loved Honor Harrington because she had such awesome space battles. And, you know, I could sort of ignore that, you know, there are these, you know, sort of very cardboard communists that they're fighting and these very sort of cardboard liberals that are always the people in the wrong and, you know, all of that stuff that's that's sort of just laced into his book um, uh, because his space battles are so fabulous. Um, as long as they're launching nuclear missiles, I'm happy. Um, <laughs> so, so in that kind of case, you know, I'm pretty, I, I, I enjoy it a fair amount actually. Um, you know, where the story still does what the story is I'm signing up for, I'm signing up for the military SF experience. Um, I think it's harder when the story specifically and overtly is aimed at, uh, you know, at genuinely undermining my value system. Um, I think that's where I'll start to push back and start to think I want to put a book down. Um, you know, if, 
if I'm reading something that's just, you know, flat out overtly racist or something like that, or mm -hmm. flat out overtly homophobic, and actually celebrates that, you know, celebrates mm -hmm. that racism or celebrates that homophobia or whatever the thing is, um, that's the moment when I become very, very uncomfortable with what I'm reading. And, and, and it's, it's, you know, as opposed to left, right politics, it, it's sort of more about values. And I mm -hmm. think, and I think that's, you know, for me also, when I'm writing novels, and people will, will push back, that's the moment when, you know, I've, I've actually working a story that genuinely undermines their values in some way, you know, like the, the person that you were talking about didn't like my, um, you know, sort of GMO dystopia or whatever. It's for him, that's both too overt. And there's a specific agenda there that's that's somehow deeply in conflict with what he actually believes, I, I suspect. Um, and at that moment, you know, he says, okay, forget it. This is too much. Um, and so I, I think that that's, that's where I actually will just set a book down and be like, yeah, this isn't really, um, I'm not interested in this. Have you gotten any just like letter, like really, really angry letters from fans that stick out in your minds of people who disagreed with your politics? Uh, the angriest letters I've always gotten have always been from liberals actually. Uh, <laughs> Um, and those have to do with the identity politics in the books. Um, and so in some cases, uh, the books that I've written have been, I've been accused of being either racist or, uh, misogynistic or other things like that. And so those are, those are the most, uh, vitriolic attacks actually. Um, I think it's actually really interesting to the, the line you're drawing between, you know, the value system versus the political spectrum thing, because, um, when I was thinking about this top, this panel topic, I was trying to think of, you know, what sorts of stories I may have enjoyed that had something that was against my value system or my political belief system. And, um, and I, and I, I, nothing, uh, I didn't come up with a lot of stuff that was like obvious. I mean, there's things like Starship Troopers where, you know, I didn't agree with the political stuff in there, but I mean, I thought it was an interesting, uh, future. Um, and then I thought of something that was actually kind of strangely upsetting to me because uh, I recently had a story submitted to me at light speed and I won't name it, but it was by a notable author. And so I was really excited to get it. And I read the story and I mean, I had some other issues with it, but ultimately one of the things that really helped me decide to reject it was the fact that it was anti geek. Uh, and, mm. and, and, and it's funny because like, I, I was thinking like, you know, I would probably publish a story that had something in it like, you know, like Heinlein or whatever, where the political stuff in it was something I didn't agree with. But when it came to geek, I was like, I can't, I, I it's like, I can't advocate that, you you're know, like, and it's you're like, against my people. I'm a right, <laughs> you know, I know. I mean, it sounds ridiculous. Right. But I mean, that is like at the core of my being, you know, and it's like, right. and, 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 you know, so like so the idea of actually publishing a story that was like so specifically, it felt to me so specifically against it. And there was characters in it that were specifically speaking against it. Um, so, and it felt like the author was saying it through the character. So I just thought it was very strange to me to come to that realization that that's like a line I won't cross. It just occurs to me, I was just thinking about another story that, that really went against my political value system. And actually I have to say it was old man's war by, uh, John Scalzi, mm -hmm. which is really interesting from a couple of different levels. Um, first, because the value system of the story is there is perpetual war. Humanity must fight in order to survive. There is the only solution is to fight. There are no other options. Which you know the 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 structure of story on that at that moment is is violence is the only solution set. Um, and in fact, explicitly, there's you know characters who are set up as sort of straw men for you know saying, oh no, we need to you know try to negotiate with our you know with our enemies, or we need to talk to them, and these people promptly get wiped out. <laughs> um, and uh, and so the, there's a, a political uh, a value system simply in the structure of the story. Once you say. There's only one option, which is to fight, to fight, to fight. And there's only one way to survive, which is to fight, to fight, to fight, um, which was really interesting when you also look at. So that was actually I found that the story extremely well executed and I found the politics extremely um, sort of uh, almost comically cardboard in a lot of ways. Um, and uh, and it's interesting, too, because if you read that novel and as many people have read that novel, they can make a lot of assumptions of who John Scalzi is based on that on that book. And then if you go over and spend any time on his blog, um, you, you see the people who've read his books become extremely disappointed <laughs> that John isn't the, the right wing 
you know, guns blazing lunatic that his book, you know, Old Man's War seems to advocate um, that he is. And uh, and I find that really fascinating that here's a book that like, you know, really genuinely doesn't seem to reflect anything of the nuance that he sort of looks at the world with. And yet, you know, this is a creation of his, which is, has gotten a, a huge amount of love and, and attention inside of science fiction. Uh, you know, like John was saying, like with Heinlein, you could read Stranger in a Strange Land and then Starship Troopers and not know what his actual views are. But with someone like John Scalzi, if you read his blog, you know what his views are on everything. Right. And I just wonder, you know, are we missing, are we losing some of the mystique of writers if we know exactly what they think about every, if we can just go on their blog and read everything they think about every issue? Well, thank God, because I like John so much more knowing, <laughs> <laughs> knowing the rest of him. <laughs> um, I mean, I think this is a weird thing, actually. I think that, uh, you know, it, I'm not I'm not even sure if you, you want to speak about mystique so much as it's just the question of whether or not does your writing lose some of its power and impact if people sort of see the puppet master behind it, um, if they see you as a human being pulling all of the strings. What is how does that change the reader's relationship to the writing? Um, and uh, I, I, you know, I, it's it's inevitable at this point that that's exactly going to be the case. I think writers, you know, both as individual personalities and as and as writers are both going to be known now as opposed to sort of like you. There's going to be very few, I think, successful writers in the future who can sort of pull off the Cormac McCarthy thing where they they hide in the shadows and are never seen. And all you all you get to interact with is their work. I think Paolo's dead on. I think there's there's going to be a lot that the, the authors who are moving forward in, in this world are ones are like, you know, we've got our John Scalzi's and Cory Doctorow's, people who both live online and are fairly easy to sort of get to know as well as, you know, we, we have their work. You know, with people like Cory, it's really interesting how both his online persona and his work line up and his politics all line up like ducks right. in a row. John Scalzi, he's he's very interesting in that uh, some of the people who like his work are 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 have this sort of antagonistic relationship with him sometimes, um, and uh, you know when I started out in, in in my career I got a little bit of that washback because I I I, I I'm trying to do pulp adventure action adventure science fiction only I do it with uh, characters of color and. It was very interesting. I've been uh, nominated for the Libertarian SF Award, and I really disappointed some of the people who help run it because I mentioned that whenever I get nominated for it, I get a shitload of racist hate mail hmm. because there are a lot of libertarians who also have that <laughs> overlapping Venn diagram of being racist. Um, and pointing that out is, you know, like if you're libertarian and not racist, that would hurt your feelings. I can completely understand why they would send me sort of like hurt puppy emails like, why are you calling us all racist? And I'm like, no, I'm not. I'm just saying that whenever I've been nominated for it, and I've been nominated for it twice, and bless you, everyone who nominated and read my books, because I'm obviously someone who whose politics don't overlap with theirs, and they still read my books and said, like, hey, he's doing something very interesting and would like to nominate him. And I'm always very honored when something like that happens, in some ways more honored because they had to overcome the difference in politics. But then what happens is that the people who are not, you know, running the award or something like get their hands on the short list and they read all the books and then all of a sudden I just get this sort of vituperative like belch of the internet aimed in my direction. <laughs> that's always just sort of like, oh crap, that's right. That happens. Mm -hmm. That's my next band is going to be a vituperative belch. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's actually, oh, this, I sorry. think it's because there's this, there, you know, like we're, we're saying that uh, works have to be uh, explicitly political to achieve a reaction, but they don't have to because there is this water we swim in of our own culture and our own culture is like extremely politicized in some direction. In other words, like if you write a straight line action adventure, even just movie, and we're talking about works that we bounced off of, but actually I bounce off of works that are not explicitly political, but works that are actually very mainstream because of embodied assumptions often well yeah i think so like oh like the whole action adventure genre that the moment where the hero tortures the person into giving up the information and they're never wrong to torture that person that's like one of those tropes right well, and I mean, honestly, one of those tropes once, that i've once... fallen into and and if you subvert that in some way even if you're writing a really big epic action adventure uh piece and you suddenly have a character that tortures someone and then that information is wrong which is more likely to actually be what happens like a bunch of people will get upset because what you're doing is you're actually then getting people to question the nature of something that is completely buried assumptions. And I guess by having black people like run around in outer space and 
kill people and do things in the same way that white characters does gets some people to sort of suddenly go like, whoa, hold on a second. And then that comes that that blowback, even though from my perspective, I'm not even really kind of doing anything radical. Mm, all right, Toby, Paolo's dying to jump in. I'm here. sorry. No, 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 no. Well, it's just, it's just, I'm actually just wanting to sort of tail on to what exactly what you're saying, which is, you know, so speaking about like sort of political agendas, speaking about values, and then there's this other layer, which is sort of all life is political, you know, like just um, everything that we do and all stories on some level will, will contain values, whether those are recognized values or unrecognized values. I mean, honestly, if you say I'm writing an action adventure story, this automatically means that there are certain values embedded inside of it and certain political sort of viewpoints embedded inside of it. Like just because action adventure implies that there's going to be a weapon. <laughs> <laughs> um, and the, the moment you've got a character with a weapon, you know, there's going to be a set of values about solution sets that that character engages in. And one of those is going to be using its weapon. Um, and so suddenly you're having, you, you, you may not consciously be recognizing that you're having a conversation about violence or nonviolence, but that is there embedded inside of that story. And, mm -hmm. and similarly, if you have a black person in your story, there's another set of conversations that exist around that black person. If that black person is the hero who goes off into space, boom, you know, suddenly who knew you were having a political conversation, but you were. And similarly, you know, if you have women in your stories and what roles they take and what parts they play in the story are also going to come with ranges of embedded values that either sort of um, completely hold up our stereotypes and our uh, storytelling tropes or cliches or, Mm -hmm. um, or, you know, sort of meta stories, or they're going to subvert those. And each of those uses of character and of identity are also going to have, uh, impacts on readers and they will interpret those as being political or apolitical or right or wrong, um, as well. And that's, that's sort of a fascinating space to be swimming in where, where it's just simply by assembling characters on a page, it's a political act. Let's talk about the impact on the readers. Cause I mean, I think authors like to think that, you know, that we write these stories, then people that are admiring readers, you know, <laughs> are, are going to just adopt all of our views. But um, I don't know, John, what do you, you want to talk about this? Like, do you think that, you know, when you publish stories, books that people like change their politics ever uh, as a result of that? <laughs> yeah, no, actually, the thought of that actually horrifies me that people <laughs> may may change their political views because of uh, fiction they read. Um, I mean, uh, on the one I mean, that's sort of the you know, jokey answer to say that. But I mean, it is actually really interesting because like, I feel like I probably have been shaped more by the fiction that I've read than any nonfiction I've read. But it's an interesting sort of launching point to make you start thinking about these issues in a way that you probably wouldn't have thought about them in the first place. Um, actually, when Toby was talking about libertarianism, that was reminding me of uh, a time where I read, I read a Robert J. Sawyer story called The Hand You're Dealt. And, you know, he's Canadian, so it's like there, it's like libertarianism isn't anything that he's like, uh, you know, familiar with, um, you know, as a political, as a political thing. But, um, boy, you're going to you get know. lots of hate mail from the Canadian libertarian. <laughs> right. Well, I, I don't know. Maybe there are a lot of libertarians. Uh, but, um, you know, he uh, he had written this story and it's a libertarian story, but I read it outside the context of the libertarian anthology that it appeared in. So I didn't know. Um, I just read the story cold. And then like he had an afterword or something that was talking about, um, you know, libertarianism and whatnot. And uh, but it, the really interesting thing to me was that I was reading the story and it had this weird uh, these weird uh, political things in it, like um, or not really political, but more like uh, governmental structure in the sense that, you know, libertarianism is very very tiny government you know and so like in the story it's a detective story and there's a murder and so people had to pay like they had to hire the services of police to go investigate the crime because there's no governmental uh police force and so like i was re i just read the story and i thought that was cool and then when i got to the afterward and saw that it was like a libertarian thing i'm like wait a minute that's like a real philosophy um because like i wasn't really familiar with libertarianism at the time i mean i'd like heard of it but i didn't really know what the tenets of it were and uh so i, I just think that kind of thing is interesting if you can have a story that makes the reader uh become aware of these issues and like you, you think about them i think that's cool but um i can't say that i think that anything that i've done is as uh you know, any anthology that I've done has, has convinced anyone to change their views about anything. But I mean, who knows? Well, I can personally testify to the power of Ayn Rand to turn my college <laughs> roommate into a raging douchebag. So. <laughs> I I think books can have a huge impact on people's views. Yeah, no, I mean, and Ayn Rand is a great example where she I mean, but I mean, you know, the Bible as well. I mean, you know, at some <laughs> point, literature 
seems to have, you know, if people connect with the right piece of literature or, you know, you see it a different way, the wrong piece of literature, they can form their entire personality around the structures that are introduced to them. And that's why I write for kids. <laughs> <laughs> um, um, actually, though, you know, one of the commenters on on Facebook or Twitter, I don't remember which, uh, was saying how Orson Scott Card is like one of the worst people with uh, like injecting his political views into his fiction. And I thought that was really kind of a weird and interesting thing to say, just because like I've read tons of Orson Scott Card and m most of it before I had heard his various political views. And I would have never guessed that. Like I was completely yeah. shocked and blindsided when he came out with um, his views on gay marriage and whatnot. You know, and I know uh, some folks like John Kessel have a very different view of Ender's Game, but I mean, like I read Ender's Game and it feels like this really human narrative that like makes you sort of like understand goodness better. And uh, and then there's just like a lot of stuff in there that just seems really. Yeah, I, I think antithetical to what he, he says, like in nonfiction circles. Yeah, no, I think I think the Kessel critique is actually a real stretch, actually. Um, I don't think that it actually fully encompasses what Ender's Game is. And I, I, you sort of have a feeling that there's a personal agenda behind that critique of Ender's Game. Uh, the, you know, Orson Scott Card is, you know, his, his viewpoints, you know, for me at least are so utterly reprehensible that it's a shock that I can love some of his books so much. Um, and, and that, that dichotomy is, has always sort of confused me. Um, you know, when I found out what he was like in terms of his personal political views, I, I almost couldn't understand how he could have created such humane stories and things like Ender's Game and Speaker for the Dead. Uh, <laughs> to be fair, uh, Orson Scott Card was, as from what I understand, I don't know a ton about history since I arrived on the in the field in the late '90s, early 2000s. But from what I understand, he used to be a secular humanist back in the, in the '70s and '80s. Maybe I, I'm not sure when exactly he got turned or what the circumstances of that were, or what he when he decided to bounce off. But uh, also remember that human beings have tremendous capacity to change and become different people at different stages in their life. And so I wonder if perhaps, because none of his other work has actually ever really struck me the same as those earlier works of his, I wonder if there's a, a process of that, uh, you know, being more maybe possibly different writer, different human being at a different place in his life. Um, actually, that just reminds me, like one of the most political books I have actually come across uh, in science fiction fantasy is there's this anthology of comics called uh, ARG, and it's like a, it's an acronym and it stands for Artists Against Raging Go Government Homophobia. And it was edited by Alan Moore. It came out in the, I think, late 80s or maybe early 90s. Um, and uh, so in Brave New Worlds, I reprinted a story from it called uh, From Homogenous to Honey by Neil Gaiman, and uh, it's drawn by Brian Talbot. And it's one of my favorite examples of political science fiction, uh, but uh, I just thought it was really interesting that, um, so this book ARG was done specifically in response to some um, some law being passed in the UK that was some sort of a homophobic type law and, you know, uh, inhibited the rights of, of gay people. And so, you know, Alan Moore got together all these top comic artists and writers and they put together this anthology with the goal of, you know, trying to change people's minds to show how ridiculous it was. Um, and I, I thought from Homogenous to Honey actually does a very good job of it. It's uh, it's basically a story where uh, people go back in time and they go and they try to, you know, erase gay people from existence and um, and then, you know, sort of spoiler alert, but um, as a result of it, you know, it just makes everyone completely uh, the same and without mm. any, any interesting things about them at all, because they've gone back and they've destroyed everyone who is different or whatever. And so um, I think it hits pretty hard and uh, you can actually go read it online. If you go to the Brave New Worlds website, there's a link to it. And, and the whole comic is just online on, on Brian Talbot's website. Well, and Alan Moore is just like a straight up anar like anarchism <laughs> as a political philosophy. He, he said something I thought was so striking. I, I forget the exact numbers, but he says, you know, like a group comprising 0.1% of the human population has been responsible for 99% of the murders throughout all of human history. Mm. And that group is leaders. If we just <laughs> get rid of the leaders, you know, that solves all our problems. You know, as uh, 
as a centr- as someone who's vaguely centrist, maybe probably left of center at this point in his life, I mean, basically anyone I try to engage with is going to hold different political opinions than me. And in fact, anyone who lives from outside of the country I'm currently residing probably has a different political point of view than I do. So it's it's uh, can be very confusing for some people I see online when they come across like an Ian McLeod, who's sort of a libertarian leftist living in the UK, who has some very interesting points of view and creates some very fascinating fiction. And it's, I think, you know, one of the things about fiction that I love is that as a youngster, it broadened my horizons to read. And the, the cool thing about fiction is, unlike any other form of media, is we actually get to live in another person's head. And that's something that's hard to replicate anywhere else. And that, I think, opens our minds to other ways of thinking and other ways of being. And I think that's, I think that can be profound for someone who only encounters a couple books. But I think anyone who's well-read is going to be fairly comfortable with the idea of coming across lots of different kinds of personalities. And so, gosh, I would hope that readers are influenced, but not... I don't. I hate it when readers like look at someone and think that that person's like a guru. I hate guruism. I just hate guruism, right? Where people just go like, "Oh, this one author, I'm going to adopt all their tenets. They they figured out life." You know, if you read most of the backstories of these authors, they haven't figured out life. You know, like Anne Rand died using social insurance under a false name and living off of the help of other people. You know, it's like obviously objectivism worked really awesomely for her. Um, <laughs> You know, and and he, and you read about you know people who have other uh, belief systems who just you look at their lives and you're like, no, these people didn't have it together. They were fascinating thinkers. They have you know things that I want to steal or things that bring me comfort or things that open my mind further to other possibilities. I'm grateful for, you know, the sort of gay lesbian uh, writers who wrote really fascinating stories that kind of got me as a sort of mildly homophobic teenager to kind of open up my horizons and suddenly go like, hey. Why do I have these biases? Why do I, you know, like, where, where's all this stuff coming from? And that, that opened me up. They didn't brainwash me. But by being able to empathize and live in another person's shoes, I was really able to sort of live other lives and walk miles in other people's shoes and really gain a much larger, larger sort of capacity to understand other points of view, other people. I mean, one thing I wanted to bring up is that a lot of times people will criticize a story. They'll say, oh, the, the message was obvious, as if that in itself is, you know, that's, that's the last word on the subject. Oh, if the message is obvious, then, <laughs> then it's by, you know, sort of by definition, a bad story. And I, I really wonder about that because, I mean, one of my sort of favorite things I heard is that apparently when uh, Marriott Beecher Stowe, who wrote Uncle Tom's Cabin, in the middle of the Civil War, she was invited to the White House and she was a very uh, diminutive woman. And Lincoln, who was very tall, apparently said to her, so you're the little woman who started this great big war because that book had had such a big influence on galvanizing public opinion against slavery. And I haven't read it, but my understanding is that the book is not in any way painted in shades of gray, right? That the no, the slaveholders are really, really nasty and the heroes are really, really heroic and good. And so if a book that's so black and white could have such a sort of positive impact on the world, what is the problem with books having messages that are like quote unquote obvious uh i I think that it's not so much that the message is obvious i mean we look at something like george orwell's 1984 the message is pretty damn obvious (laughs) (laughs) um that's not oftentimes the problem the question is whether or not it's interesting Mm. um and i think that you know when when you say the message is obvious okay that's fine but like, am I bored now? Is this the only thing that's happening is this message or is it deepening my understanding in some other way? I mean, I think that, you know, there's there's no question that, you know, the, that there are stories where their their value system, their message, everything is is entirely obvious. And yet they're still revealing. Um, and. And I, I think that there are a bunch of different ways that storytelling can attack that, um, whether that's through making the story really interesting, even though the values are very plain. Um, you know, I mean, the, the thing I worry about a lot of times in my fiction is I worry about whether or not, you know, my good guys have the good values and my bad guys have the bad values, because normally that's a huge red flag that you're moving towards didacticism. Mm-hmm. Um so a lot of the things I like to do is I like to, you know, make my world the broken thing that defines what my values are. Do I think that, you know, companies like Monsanto should control food. Here's an entirely broken world based on that premise. Most of the characters in the story, they don't really have any values one way or the other very clearly about that that topic. The world has some opinions and those are going to be hitting mm. pretty hard. 
but you're going to experience that as setting. You aren't going to experience that as plot exactly. And and yet, you know, there, there are still readers who will say, oh, that's just, you know, that those assumptions are too bald for me. Um, I, I think that I, I sort of feel like you can actually get away with a lot as long as you're you're still performing that sort of trickster function of being an entertainer as well. Well, let's consider and, uh, what what uh, Quentin Tarantino has done recently in just two movies. Uh, he's done, you know, Nazis are bad, and he did Slavery is Bad for his last news two movies. Newsflash. <laughs> Newsflash, mm-hmm. right? Uh, and yet they're still uh, tremendously entertaining and interesting movies in many ways. There's a lot of stuff you can sort of unpack and get into about those movies. And just the fact that the core central message is on the nose you know, mm-hmm. uh, the same critique of Uncle Tom's Cabin could be made, maybe, of Django Unchained. The slave owners in that are horrifically evil and over the top. It's quite obvious uh, who is the good and the bad in those stories. And yet that doesn't really particularly take away from the fact that they're, like, as as Paolo said, interesting. I think being not interesting is, like, the greatest crime. Mm. Uh, I will... I will, uh, you know, happily read a, a novel that is at odds with things that I believe. If it's interesting, I will immediately put down a novel that has shares the same values I do. If it's boring, if it's if it's not interesting, and there's plenty of stuff that you know you come across where you go like, in theory, I should like this, but good grief, you know, I this is not holding me. Well, Paolo, when you were talking about the world being broken, that kind of made me think like almost the opposite is Ian Banks's culture. Um, series, which has like the most amazing world, even though that's not the focus of the story. And a lot of the people who come, uh, a lot of our listeners said that uh, they described Banks as a, a, a an author with a political agenda. And I'm actually curious for other people's take on that, because I read the culture novels, and I don't get the sense that they're didactic at all. It's just that the culture is so amazing, that, you know, you, you want to, you can't help but uh, pine <laughs> for that sort of society. But this, the point of it's not like the point of the plot is to show you, yeah, the culture is awesome. And I, I really adore the Ian Banks novels. And in fact, for me, one of the greatest unfortunacies of, for me as a, as a fan was to never, ever see him win one of our field's major awards. It's mm. was really devastating for me that he passed without any sort of recognition along those lines. Um, and was talking, was I talking to you about this Paolo, which was why I thought that he did not get some of those major awards was that his characters are often observers that, that his I don't know if it's his political philosophy that he does not buy into the great man theory of history. They aren't, they aren't the epic actors. <laughs> yeah. And yeah. as a result, because they're they're observers to this culture, this artifact, they don't have that sort of messianic thing that, that we reward that a lot of the uh, our, our more centrist culture here in the U.S. in particular, where a lot of fandom exists in numbers, which tends to re- regard messianic figures as really great. Uh, figures in our in our field. I was like, in order for Ian Banks to have won an award, I thought he was probably going to have to do something like Dune and create a, mm-hmm. you know, uh, a figure of that level. And he never he never did that. His his figure that was amazing was the culture in and of itself. That was the character of all those books, and that wasn't enough. Well, somebody um, earlier, uh, I guess Paolo earlier mentioned John Castle, and I saw him on a panel one time, and he was saying that. You know, he works in academia and he was saying that uh, like science fiction generally doesn't get accepted into sci- uh, into academia unless it has some political angle that, you know, like feminists can latch onto it or or mm-hmm. whatever. And so I just wonder, will uh, is that is that sort of one way in which these political, very political works will survive so that they'll sort of get absorbed into uh, academia, whereas works that are you know just as good in other ways, but don't have that sort of political angle won't be. I think that this sort of, uh, especially this layer of cultural acceptance, um, where it says, oh, this is now literature as opposed to story, um, is a huge, there's a huge gap there. And when we're talking about science fiction, um, so often we're celebrating story. And then I almost feel like there's a, there's a quality in literature that demands a certain didacticism almost. <laughs> um it's almost as if if you write, uh, you know, a feminist science fiction novel, or if you write an ecotopia or whatever the thing is, that then people can say, well, you can ignore the story now. It's okay. You can ignore the fact that it's a story because it's about things. Um, and and there, there's there's something very interesting about our sort of like 
you know, definitions of what is good and what is not good or what is good and what is trash genre or, you know, and, you know, I, I think we also make a lot of sort of strange exceptions as we go along. When we, when we find something we really, really love, we find a reason mm. to call it legitimate. <laughs> yeah. But it's an interesting, an interesting dilemma for me. Cause I think that one of the things we do in science fiction is we kind of unpack the technology as political you know, if the phrase is the personal is political with science fiction, it's the technology is political. Yeah. And, and there's no academic field of study for that. Exactly. Yes. It's really like, you know, make that celebrate that as a, as a, as a legitimized sort of investigation of the state of humanity. Exactly. And, and having, having been someone who was a tech support person on a campus, I just have to say that there is less of an impact on technology in terms of the technology as as political, the technology as personal, than I would you know like to see, and I think that definitely has a secondary side of impact because the people who have been sort of science fiction's allies inside of academia have been engineers, not exactly uh, the humanities, and so that is something that's being overcome. I mean, if you go to somewhere like ICFA, you can see that there's a tremendous uh, growth now thanks to the internet, thanks to an entire generation of, of academics who grew up experiencing pop culture and particularly science fiction's impact on pop culture who are trying to remedy that. But I still actually think there's a, there's a long uh, road ahead of us still in terms of that generalized overall acceptance. And, and what you noted is, is still true that when I have works of mine that do get interrogated or looked at by academia, it does tend to be like, well, here we're going to look at this for the idea of multiculturalism in outer space and less for the technology side of things that I, I try to explore. All right. Well, well Paolo, I'm curious because obviously you wanted to address the issues of race and immigration and industrial meat in America. Yeah. And so I'm just wondering how you chose uh, the form of a novel called Zombie Baseball Beatdown <laughs> as right. the best way of addressing those issues. Well, so uh, honestly, I, I came into the issues, uh, I sort of actually walked backwards into the issues uh, the originally when I was writing that book. I mean, this is a kid's book, and and it was originally written because I was wanting to write uh, a story for uh, a boy in one of my wife's classes. My wife's a school teacher, and he didn't like reading, and all he wanted to read about was zombies. And so I was like, okay, well, I can write a zombie book for you, kid. Like, and uh, And... And so originally, you know, I mean, if there was any political sort of agenda, it was simply that I want boys to read and not become sort of video game sort of morons. You know, no offense to video games or anything, but I sort of feel like reading provides certain valuable things in our society and, and not having boys reading is a sort of a dangerous precedent to set. Um, so I wanted to write a book that he would engage with. And then as I was working on it, you know, it layer by layer parts of it, uh, the, the, uh, my other sort of political angles sort of got involved. And some of this was, you know, decisions about who's going to be on the page. And one of the things I wanted to do was I wanted to have uh, a half Indian kid in the, in the story because my son is half Indian. And so as soon as I plug this half Indian kid into the story, he carries a certain weight inside of the story then. And he's in a small white Iowa town. What's that like for him? How does he interact with the world? What's it like to be this very different kind of kid? Um, so suddenly race, you know, automatically now is part of the discussion in the story. Um, and then as soon as I start thinking about where does the zombie plague come from, I was like, oh, let's bring it from the meatpacking plant. I've always, you know, really been annoyed at the E. coli plagues that sort of s seem to come out of uh, meatpacking plants anyway. Like this is a fun way to sort of talk about zombies, but also look, we can talk about meat too and where our food comes from. And so, you know, but once you've done that, then you've got this meatpacking plant there and that also carries all sorts of political values with it. What is industrial meat? Where does it come from? How does it get processed? Um, what are the safety checks that we have on meat? Um, and then who works inside of a meatpacking plant? And then you, you start talking about uh, you start talking about immigrant labor. Uh, and that moves you again back into race and, and then into other questions about what it means to be an American, working legally versus illegally. And so almost by having certain characters or certain set pieces then 
you know, the politics of, of thinking about these things, they, they naturally flow into the story as well. Um, it was supposed to just be a story about kids beating up zombies with baseball bats <laughs> and, and it became much, much more. And actually it's, it's, it's one of the books I'm most proud of writing. And, uh, and oddly, it's one of my most, uh, it's, it's actually a book where I get to the climax scenes and, and they're deeply affecting for me still. Well, I, th I think it's interesting how a lot of times you can't get away from politics, even if you try. I mean, like I, I was going to I want to talk about how, um, you know, Robert Heinlein wrote a book about aliens taking over people called The Puppet Masters and said that he meant it to be an allegory for Soviet communism. And Jack Finney wrote a very similar story called Invasion of the Body Snatchers that he said was just a cool story about aliens attacking. <laughs> and but they're basically the same story. And would it even be possible to write a story about aliens taking over people in the 1950s without it sort of having something to say about people's fears of communist subversive infiltration, stuff like that. Yeah, no, I, I think, well, the, well or the, the zeitgeist wouldn't be able to interpret that in any other way. Mm -hmm. I mean, that, that's the thing almost that the, 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 once the, the, you know, I mean, maybe the symbol really is, you know, Oh, it's just aliens grabbing people, but, but we've got this sort of fifth column sort of zeitgeist story as well. And that means that nobody can actually interact with that story. It, it, you know, how the zeitgeist interacts with your story and how you thought you wrote the story, those are very, very different things. And you don't really have a lot of control over it. And so I think, yeah, sort of inside of your time and place, the story is actually going to be swallowed up by its readership and, and they're going to do what they do with it. And you thought you might have been doing one thing and it can end up being something completely different. I still think of Ray Bradbury recently who claimed that Fahrenheit 451 wasn't really a, you know, book about censorship. <laughs> and, you know, and he proceeded to say a bunch of different things and you're kind of like, well, now I'm going to keep with my interpretation. <laughs> <laughs> book well, burning I, is bad. <laughs> have you guys had, had people, had um, just random readers attribute political views to you that they saw in your uh, writing that you were just like, that's just crazy? I feel like I might have, and this isn't something where I'd had people come up to me directly, but I had a whole bunch of people on Facebook at one point who were following me. And I can't remember what I was saying about sort of, um, you know, GM foods and a bunch of other things, just they're sort of just, you know, sort of very run of the mill sort of comments of mine about whatever it was, capitalism, cynical corporations, something or another. And I got an immense amount of pushback from a whole bunch of, of my Facebook followers. And I had this moment where I thought, wait a second, how can you be following me on Facebook? If you've read <laughs> any of my, if you've read any of my stories at all, you've got to know exactly where I'm coming from. Like, why would you, why would you even sign up to follow me? I, I don't, I don't get it. And so there was a moment where I sort of had the feeling that people were there. They maybe either, they were confusing you with some other Paolo Bacigalupi. <laughs> right, exactly. Well, I think maybe, I, it, well, in some ways I did sort of suspect that I'd almost done my job too well in some cases, that it, there were enough other aspects in the story that were interesting that my politics maybe did sort of flow past them. Um, they were there for the story. They liked the story. It was exotic and interesting and strange and different science fiction for them. And that was that was enough for them to connect with me. And then, oh, wow, now they've met me and they hate my values. <laughs> <laughs> all right cool so we should probably start wrapping this up i guess before we do john you had a bunch of other stories that you uh wanted to mention right uh that you that you've published uh yeah um i mean uh like i like i mentioned uh, the living dead is is one of the more political anthologies i did uh and, and in that book uh so a couple stand out there's death and suffrage by dale bailey which is uh, which is another story about voting, uh, but in that one, it's basically about uh, dead soldiers coming back to life to vote, and you know they sort of uh, overturn an election because uh, once their votes are counted, it, it sort of outs outs ousts the president that uh, had it all sent them off to die. Um, and there's beautiful stuff by Susan Powlick, which is uh, explicitly a, a 9/11 story. You know, it's a reaction to 9/11. Um, uh, and then uh, uh, Charles Coleman Finley, uh, who writes as C.C. Finley these days, uh, he's he's written a couple stories that I, I would consider among the more political I've published. Uh, he had one of Brave New Worlds, you know, a reprint uh, called Pervert. Um, that one's about, uh, yeah, that one's about, uh, you know, uh, gay rights and, and that kind of stuff. And um, he has he had one in Lightspeed uh, called The Infiltrate, um, and it's sort of about the, the line between terrorists and hero, um, which I think is really interesting because, you know, terrorists are called terrorists by the people that they're fighting against, but then in their homeland, they're called freedom fighters. Um, and uh, he sort of explores that in his story a little bit. 
And then uh, Ken Liu has a story called The Perfect Match, uh, which is uh, basically about uh, companies like a, a company very much like, uh, shall we say, Google, um, that uh, is gathering all sorts of data on you and, and you know, spying on you and basically uh, knows everything about you. So, I mean, those are those are the ones that sort of had all come to mind. Um, you know, the Lightspeed ones you can all read online for free. And uh, some of the some of the other ones I mentioned, uh, if you go to the, go to the websites for those anthologies, uh, some of those are available online also. All right, cool. So, uh, Toby or Pelo, any last words or any other recommendations you want to throw out or anything like that? I think I'm all finished. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, uh, uh, it, one of the things I always encourage people to try to do is just read widely, you know, and, and get outside of your comfort zone. You may be surprised at, at what you find there. I was just commenting on Twitter not too long ago that people are often surprised at what I consume and what I do read and what I like in pop culture uh, because they kind of get set in their head what it is I produce and what it is I like. But I try to keep to pretty wide tastes because I never know when something is going to twig in and catch my catch my fancy. All right, cool. So I think that's a good note to end on. So I think we're going to wrap things up there. So Toby, thanks for joining us. Hey, thanks for having me on the show. And Paolo, thanks for joining us. Thanks. It was fun to do. And of course, big thanks again to Margaret Atwood for being our guest today. A huge, huge thank you as well to Jason Lind for becoming the first person to set up an account to make monthly payments to us via PayPal. Now, this is a brand new button. We just set it up. So thank you, Jason. We really appreciate it. And you guys can learn more by going to our website at geeksguideshow.com and clicking on subscribe. And as always, please review us on iTunes and follow us on Facebook and Twitter. And if you live in the New York area and want to hang out with me and other listeners, be sure to follow Geeks Guide NYC on Twitter. All right, so that was our show. Thanks, everyone, for listening, and we'll see you next time. The Geeks Guide to the Galaxy is a production of Wired.com. For more information about the show, visit geeksguideshow.com. To learn more about your hosts, visit johnjosephadams.com or davidbarkirtley.com. Music and voiceover produced by Slipgate 9 Entertainment. If you enjoyed this program, tell your friends. If you didn't enjoy it, tell no one. Thank you for listening.